Yeah, I mean AI. Gosh, if you're not at least curious about AI,、uh, I think I think you're in trouble these days. I guess to kick it off,、uh, one thing that I think we're both big on on a personal level is these kind of intense personal growth experiences. You know, I've been to Burning Man, done the ayahuasca thing for a couple weeks before.、Uh, you know, big on kind of taking trips out in nature to national parks like Zion or Big Sur, taking mushrooms and just enjoying nature and, and going inward、uh, to kind of refresh myself, dial in my creativity, and just have some outside of the box insights.、Uh, I'm curious to know more about this year's intense personal growth experience. For you, and, and maybe one in the past that's been really transformative. Yeah, I am such a fan of those experiences. They're so pivotal. They're so pivotal. I feel like those have been each of the the major turning points in my not just my career and my business, but my life. And now that you you mention it. It's been a while. It's been a while. You know, in the last couple of years, we we had two kids and a dog. Got a dog. Bought a house. Moved back to the U.S. and started hiring. That was the other thing. So a lot more responsibility. So in seemingly the blink of an eye, I went from a you know digital nomad wanderer to a responsible householder. I don't know how that happened, but、um, <laughs> it's hard to find the time. It's really hard to find the. The time and the space to go do those things. They, at this stage in my life, they feel like luxuries or like nice to haves. But at the same time, I feel the the impact of not doing them. I feel that like that the the burden, the heaviness, the sort of you know routine of of that life. So I, I think I'm due for one, to be honest. Awesome. And in terms of you know any of those, you know, what was the one that you had maybe over the past few years that was really transformative and. What does a intense personal growth experience look like for you? I think the biggest one of the past few years was be- the year before the pandemic, moving to Mexico.、Um, I think travel, in many ways, was the first sort of、uh, identity shifting transformational experience that I had. I think I went abroad to br- back to Brazil, where my family was from, when I was six months old. So it's like so core to who I am,、um, and it's it was the first one, and it's the most common one and frequent one that I've done. I've lived in a few different countries. So the most recent one was all of 2019. My wife and I lived in Mexico City. We moved there very very beginning of 2019, and we just had a blast. It's just the whole thing of. Plunging into a completely different climate and atmosphere and culture and language and culinary situation and just like you can't be the same person when everything in your surroundings have changed. So I'd say I'd say that was the last one and it ended up being so important because it was like we were in the Bay Area for like close to a decade and you don't realize when you live somewhere a long time there's this like cruft there's like this. Like I don't know how to describe it. This this just like small, like slow accumulation of just like stuff, like little habits and little mental habits, and like even like friendships that you're not that hot about, but they just kind of keep going on because it's convenient, or even romantic relationships or work routines. And you don't realize before long, like seventy percent of your time is like overhead. It's like overhead just to maintain this routine you don't even like. And we moved to Mexico City, and we, we would like wake up in the morning and just be like, "Oh my God, we don't know anyone. We have no routines, and we get get to just start over." It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, there's something、uh, amazing about yeah, just picking up, being in a new place, a new rhythm, new habits, and experiencing the energy of a new city. I'm finding, you know, I've learned a ton over the last five months now, being in a small beach town called Puerto Escondido in Mexico.、Nice. Um, yeah, and actually heading out to、uh, back to Mexico City for a week, and then off to Medellin. Uh, for two months in Colombia, and then、oh. off to、uh, Japan and Korea for probably five six months. So、I'm、yeah,、so uh, travel <laughs> travel is definitely a big part of my、uh, intense personal growth experiences as well, and something I'm continuing to lean into.、Um, so kind of to kind of evolve things. So we both are, I think, have a lot in common. I think we're systems nerds.、Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, constantly trying to find、uh, new systems to、uh, push ourselves. We're also super big on,、uh, you know. I've been running Herb for、uh, almost ten years now.、Uh, you've been running, building a second brain, I think, for around eight now,、mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Run over seventeen cohorts, I believe.、Mm-hmm. How do you continue to kind of push yourself when you've been doing that something so long?、Um, and how do you keep it fresh and keep yourself motivated? I want to hear your answer to this too, because yeah, happy to. Yeah, so, so the, the the underlying business Forte Labs is just hitting its. Ten-year anniversary this year,、uh, and then building a second brain. The program, the product, is、uh, about six years old. So yeah, it's been it's been a while. To me, this is like the challenge. 
This is the challenge of being a creator or an artist or writer or anything is like the ex it's like the explore exploit trade off, right? We're so good at exploration and novelty, finding the new thing, you know, like sort of going out to the frontier of human, you know, experience. But then, but then it's like if you ever want to have something called a profit. <laughs> You ever want to like have leverage? You ever want to have, my God, retirement savings or some nest egg, anything of that sort? You have to switch. You have to like almost like switch your identity into exploit uh, and just capitalize on that thing and just hammer it again and again, and optimize it, which I think is like the exact opposite of that novelty seeking that we are as, as creatives. If you're enjoying this interview with Diego Forte, you'd love the Founder West newsletter. In just three minutes a week, get a system to grow your brand, audience, and community. You can sign up via the link in the description. And when you do, you're going to get my free vision board system worth over $200. Go and sign up via the link in the description. I promise you won't regret it. Now back to the interview. With building a second brain, so there's, I, I would say two things. One is growth. Like by far the main reason to grow at all, which is optional, right? I could, I mean, very easily, and this is still tempting sometimes, just do do the solo author thing. You just write a book every few years, do some keynotes. That's an incredible lifestyle, right? But I get bored of it. So that's that's honestly mostly what led to starting to actually market the cohorts well so that they grew, which that then led to hiring and that led to the book and these different things is just to keep it interesting, honestly. And then the other thing is the, the idea, building a second brain i feel like i won the the like the brand lottery because it is somehow simultaneously very specific recognizable practical and also infinitely expandable i mean i can talk it's just information for god's sakes like <laughs> i can talk about anything i can talk about personal growth learning science business marketing everything through that lens of knowledge management so i get to you know write those write all those write all that r d off my taxes because it all has some way of connecting to you know second brand stuff <laughs> yeah now it feels like you've uh, created a lifestyle where um your business really supports and feeds your curiosity and vice versa mm -hmm. And I think it's important that, you know, if we're going to be in this for the long game, if I'm going to keep doing herb for another decade and build Founder West for a decade, it's important that not only are you doing right by the business, by the team, um, but I think where entrepreneurs often struggle is that um, they give so much to their business, but at a certain point, sometimes they hit a wall because it just doesn't feel like it's feeding their soul, feeding their yes. joy. And I feel like that's a continual kind of like recalibration you need to be doing um, as a founder as to, you know, am I actually enjoying the work? Does this still feel like it's feeding my calling? Um, in my inner joy um, and you know a continual kind of thing I look at is like um, one of my biggest values is play and so kind of constantly evaluating whether it's individual tasks or initiatives we're working on it could be something that maybe is good for the business but if it doesn't feel like play to me I either have to decide to you know buckle down for a period of time and kind of suck it up to delegate it um, or three choose to maybe go a different direction that maybe is equally or greater an opportunity, but is just more fun and feels like play. Yes. I'm curious, as you're looking at building a second brain right now, like what is it that's motivating you this year um, in your, what is like almost a decade doing this? What, what you said, I wanna highlight what you said though, this is so good, is is I, I notice this so often, I talk to like, like fledgling creators and it's like usually one to two years in, there's like a one to two year arc where the sort of initial like, flush of motivation and excitement kind of exhausts itself and they think they only have like two options either continue to hammer my head against this brick wall that barely seems to be moving or totally abandon it and go in some complete opposite direction but i'm like no 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 no. there's so many other options like you said you can automate it just put it put it on autopilot you can delegate it to someone else you can license it to someone else or sell it to someone else you can change the way you deliver it change the format you can change the frequency you deliver it at there's there's infinite dimensions of change that will allow you to keep kind of going up that growth curve that don't depend on you just doing the exact same thing i, I really I really wish creators and artists would would just I don't know I don't know I don't know what it is that keeps them from seeing those options maybe they just don't have experience with what that looks like yeah well I think it's also something that we're kind of you know again we kind of have been jamming a lot in this whatsapp group of other creators and I feel like sometimes that's the magic to it right is you, it's like a snow globe and you just need to get jumbled up a bit just to like come up with just outside of the box ideas or see how other people are approaching the problem and I think sometimes founders creators are working too much in isolation 
Um, and if you can go and find your community, your fellow, uh, you know, creators, founders, oftentimes you can get some, some more outside of the box ideas and approaches to things uh, very much to a lot of the ideas we've learned together in this uh, WhatsApp group. It's so important. I, I agree. I agree. You need models, different models of success for different periods. Yeah. So I know we've been chopping it up on things like, you know, community and that being a big theme for you as it is for me actually as well this year. Um, I know you're looking deeply into AI and the ramifications it's going to have on course creators and course production and, and building a second brain. I'm curious, uh, you know, which of these areas is kind of like um, a big push for you right now? Um, and, uh, you know, where's kind of like the frontier of your knowledge in that area in terms of how it's going to influence your business? Yeah, I mean, the frontier for me right now is exactly what we just talked about. <laughs> Is how do you step out of that role? You know, like to me, that, like I, I'm truly just just lost in this question. You hear so much about how to get started. Oh, just you know, do a new tweet thread every day, or how to grow, or how to market better. All those early stages. But I, I feel like after six, seven years, I'm at a place I can finally say there is enough to sustain itself. Right? There's enough top of funnel between the book, uh, which just actually today crossed a hundred thousand copies sold. Congratulations. 100,000. Like, wow. I feel like I did my duty. That was my job. <laughs> Love it. Huge. Proud of you, man. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Feels, feels huge. <laughs> um, the YouTube is going great. The newsletter is, is really growing fast. Like, for the first time in my career, uh, it feels like these things are happening on their own. The team is awesome. We have a team of seven that I trust completely. They, they do better than, than I do. So all the pieces are there, but there's something almost like metaphysical, almost like energetic about what it looks like, what it means for me to actually step back from that control, which I still feel I have. I still feel myself micromanaging, trying to be in all the little decisions that I just don't know how to do. I have no models for, you know, I have models for like being acquired, right? Like there's, there's a lot of contents on like what it means to sell your company, but I'm not selling. There's no, there's no exit here for me. This is too closely tied to me. So I want to be at a distance yet still connected in control, but not micromanaging. I, I'm truly, I don't know. <laughs> And have you found any sort of like systems or models for that so far um, that have helped you at least w from where you're at right now on that journey? Because I know it's tricky, right? Like with Herb, Herb is very much on autopilot. Uh, we've got an unbelievable team there of absolute rock stars that are growing that business 200% year over year and, you know, really over delivering for the brands dispensaries we work with. And I find it tricky um, as the founder and CEO of it to you know, sometimes there's that balance of like people want your help and they want your input. They don't want you to feel too distant. Yeah. That said, though, they also <laughs> don't want to be micromanaged. And I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges of like leadership and management is like that that kind of fine line in your situation as well. It's that balance of like I'm trying to be distant and trying to take on new creative pursuits. And, you know, you've got a family now, you got a house, you got a lot going on on the personal side as well. That's really filling your cup. How do you kind of right now? Um, you know, any systems that you're using to balance that right now? Oh gosh. I, I wouldn't even say it's at the systems level yet. It's at the right. just basic, like, like the real, the real practical question is, is like, how do we make that transition without revenue free falling? It's that simple, right? Like if I don't even need much growth, if revenue could just stay the same, I'd be happy. You know, the revenue we're at pays for the team has decent margins. It's fine. But, um, it's like, it's almost it, what it feels like is our whole portfolio has to be almost like deconstructed and reconstructed without me at the center. You know, these cohort based courses, it's all about the teacher. It's all about the personality. You can't just substitute a different teacher and say, oh, it's the same. The whole thing has to be reimagined as to where does the value come from. Um, but I, I'd love to know, like for you, like even something like, like what makes you or what made you remain a CEO? Why not? Why, why haven't you decided to step even further back and be like president or, you know, chairman of the board or something that's even less, you know, even further from the day to day operations? Yeah, good question. So for me, I find being a founder and a CEO fills my cup currently in terms of some of the things that are really in my icky guy. Um, you know, I'm really big on being like pushed. And I find if I'm not being pushed to like new 
uh, challenges and like the edge of my capabilities that I easily get bored and on an even sort of more negative way, which I probably just need to work on this more and more with my therapist is, you know, sometimes I can just actually just like become some destructive to myself because I'm just like twiddling my thumbs and, uh, and, and not, um, occupied with something that's really pushing me and filling up my capabilities and potential as a human. And so, um, I enjoy, you know, the aspect of leading a team. It's also a craft that I've only been doing for a decade. And I think that when you look at a lot of people that develop real mastery in something, you know, it's only after maybe 20, 30 years that you really get to some level of quote unquote mastery around that thing. And that's kind of where I'm looking to go with the art of entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. um, the art of being a CEO. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, though, similar to where you're at, I think it's also deciding on like, what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. And I don't subscribe to necessarily what other people believe like a CEO should do. I think it's a very like personal sort of role. There's definitely commonalities like hiring, managing cash flows, building a great product that people love and these sorts of things. But in terms of like how you're managing your time, how involved you are on a day to day, I think that that can look different depending on how you want to run your business. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I choose to basically almost on a quarterly basis, kind of choose like a theme. Um, it's a theme for the company oftentimes, but also then a theme on how I'm going to manage my time in that business. And mm -hmm. so that keeps it fresh. And that also keeps me focused because I've noticed that one of the things that depletes my energy is task switching. And mm -hmm. so if I'm just involved in all the things all at once, I oftentimes find myself almost getting dizzy. And yeah. if there's too many days of that, it contributes to depression, anxiety, burnout. And so I've learned to just like focus on one to two core things you can do to move the needle forward that often is around the bottleneck, which I know you're really big on identifying based on all, all the things I've read and the, the learnings you've taken from, uh, you know, Six Sigma and Toyota's manufacturing approach and such. And so, you know, as an example, the last 90 days, that was really helping Herb go and scale up and grow kind of double year over year. And so the focus is really on revenue systems, scaling the team, scaling the amount of hot leads we were getting to queue up the sales team. This next 90 days as we move into Q2 2023 are gonna be all around retention, customer experience and customer success. And so I'll be kind of dipping in that area, um, which is like, I'm gonna approach it as if I'm a you know beginner, a student, reading books, digesting things, most importantly, you know, dipping into a meeting or two a week with the squad and yeah. just seeing where they're at and really just trying to support them there. Um, so, I mean, the last bit on this is like the interaction between Herb and Founder West for me has always been interesting because with Founder West, I'm teaching entrepreneurs proven systems to scale their business to 5 million a year. Yeah. And I very much feel like Herb in that sense is almost like a lab where wow. I'm bringing this business now to $10 million plus a year. And the sort of struggles I'm going through there, um, the issues I'm facing, the challenges, the wins, the successes, all of that is stuff that I can bring back then to Founder West to help serve those people. And it's important to me uh, in, I guess, I don't know what sort of way, maybe it's an integrity thing or I don't know, that it's like I'm in the game and actually applying these actively to something yes. uh, versus just being a, you know, a Harvard professor teaching business that's never actually started a company. And so that's at least where I'm playing with it right now. But I also remain open minded that this balance and this uh, this approach to it could change. And I'm open to that. You know, maybe that maybe in a few years I find one of these things is not fitting uh, what I'm looking to do. And at that juncture, I think I'd be in a similar scenario to where you may be right now, where I'm trying to actually go and hire some people um, and remove myself even more from these entities. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where yeah, I'm at that, currently. That's powerful. What I, what I hear from that is like, you found a way to have these, these major commitments feed each other, like, like the company feeds insights and lessons and integrity to the, to your courses and, and coaching. And I'm sure the, the, the opposite is true. So rather than like competing, like one minute spent here means a minute you take away from there. They're almost like they're, they're part of a flywheel together. Exactly. You know, that's exactly how I see it. I mean, the more my personal brand grows, the more my audience grows with, say, Founder OS and personal brand, the more that people learn about Herb that are outside the cannabis industry, maybe go tell their friends who are inside of it, hey, 
if you're actually marketing with cannabis, this Matt guy, actually, that's where he came from. He knows that stuff and refer business to herb, which is actively happening. Um, the more herb grows and gets better and better and we improve systems there. Those are systems that I can help entrepreneurs with um, on the founder West side. So um, yeah, they're, they're constantly feeding each other like that. Um, and then on a deeper level too, just the more I'm building systems for both of these businesses, one business's systems can reinforce and others and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like similar to, you know, I know right now, like one big thing that we're both just going really deep and deeper on is like, we've both been reading tons of books on community as an example. Mm -hmm. And I feel like while that's a individual pursuit that you're really just diving into deeply, that's certainly something that's going to help you think through potentially the next evolution of building a second brain. Yes. I'm curious, like where, where are you currently at on the community side of things? And um, what are maybe some of the kind of key insights you've gleaned over the last few months of your kind of deep work you've been doing there? Yeah, yeah, let's get into that. Uh, let's see. So I'm thinking mostly about the the community that's been built up around around building a second brain, which was kind of accidental, which I think is the best kind of community. <laughs> um, best. Right? Uh, it was really just uh, the alumni of, I mean, one cohort after another, which was a slow process, because, you know, the first cohort was 30 people, then it was 50, then 70. So we're adding people very, very slowly. And then that kind of expanded to like the people who subscribe to our newsletter, people who watch our YouTube videos, people who now buy the book. It's like, there's sort of different pockets of people. The reason this, so there's, there's so many reasons this is important, but it's almost like, what has allowed me to do what I do? Like what, what allows me to get on these live sessions? Our biggest cohorts are like upwards of a thousand people. What allows me to stand up there and say, this is the way to manage knowledge. This is the way to take notes. This is the way to learn from, you know, from content. I really truly in my heart do not see myself as having the answer. I, I just don't. Like most people on this call have more experience and are smarter than me, honestly. There's like NASA scientists and crazy people. It's really just that I'm the ringleader. I'm the circus master of a community of practice. That is my job. I'm just surveying the community, finding little pockets of interesting things happening, elevating those things. The community is teaching itself. I'm just the, I'm like the, the maitre d', I'm like the MC that's sort of off to the side. And now that needs to be even more the case because I've, I've documented sort of what I think is the method in so many different formats that can't change. The book is like practically etched in stone, right? So I almost am like, I've said everything. I, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> Um, but I noticed so, someone recently from the community told me, oh, this is a very top down community. And I was like, what? How dare you? <laughs> I was so offended, but it's true. It's like, I get on the Zoom call. I'm the teacher broadcasting to all these people. I'm the one that wrote the book. My photo is on the website. And so now I'm thinking, how can I flip that completely on its head? And I, I just, it's not even a matter of knowledge or skills that they need. They have all that. It's just permission. I, I, I have this feeling that they're waiting, that so many like potential leaders in this community are just waiting for something. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's permission. I don't know if it's training. I don't know if it's, you know, a title or something, but that's another question that I'm in is just like, what, what are we waiting for guys? Like we can do much more than this. Yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I talked to a lot of founders that are trying to figure out the best way to empower their kind of power users and their community mm -hmm. to kind of like take that next step in really become like evangelists and become people that are bringing together others. And, um, you know, it sounds like you've built an incredibly powerful community. I think the best communities, like you said, are, are really built by accident. Uh, mm -hmm. and I know that's exactly kind of how yours is formed. And I think even more importantly, your community has been formed just very intentionally mm -hmm. and very slowly, which I think, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes you see these communities explode too fast. And I think it can be kind of the antithesis to the belonging, uh, and the sense of connection that you're trying to build in and yes. amongst the community members. So, I can imagine that very intentional, slow scaling over the last, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years has really contributed to some awesome bonds being formed. And yeah, as you're bringing up it, the question then becomes, you know, how do I kind of create that system and create the permission amongst those members so that they feel like they, they can be elevated. And this moves from a one to many type thing to a many to many, um, and there's real connection being formed amongst them. Um, totally. Yeah. One. One, one thing that I've been you know working deeply on there and I'm happy to share with you and, and the community and everyone is like uh, basically like a community playbook. Um, and so this is something you know that I've gone over um, with uh, this is actually the first thing in Founder West program um, that I go over uh, with anyone that joins is kind of like 
basically the guidelines for the community itself um, and giving people an idea of sort of, you know, who we're bringing together, which in the case of Founder Us program are these founders that are looking for clarity, looking to grow their brand and kind of win their niche. Mm -hmm. And then I get into things like, you know, what's our purpose? What's our mission? And then starting to talk about like the shared activities that we have as a community. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's oftentimes thinking about you have these, you know, I know in your case, you have a lot of these alumni members um, mm -hmm. and alumni mentors. Uh, you've created over 80 of these, I believe, over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, people that are so stoked on the program, so eager to pay it forward and help others um, that they've kind of essentially volunteered, if I'm not mistaken, to become these alumni mentors. And so mm -hmm. it feels like there's an awesome opportunity there of like, how do we kind of empower those alumni mentors, um, give them a sense of how to organize and giving them permission, as you say, uh, to kind of like basically write the next evolution of exactly. the community at building a second brain. Yeah, we do pay them. We do pay the mentors. Okay. So they're almost like coaches, but it's yep. not, I mean, for the time and commitment required, it is, it is practically a token fee. Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because what my subject is, is interesting, you know, personal knowledge management or digital note-taking, because it's, it's not really about, okay, have you internalized the correct, there's, there's no definition of correct. It's not like science or engineering where you can, you know, you can demonstrate, okay, this works or it doesn't, or it's true or not true. It is really more like, um, it's creativity. So like, anyone can teach it even the, the the you know the youngest novice has something to offer they have figured out something about creativity that they could teach others um so that's that's kind of cool that leadership and um and being a source of wisdom is open to so many people but then at the same time something that continuously astounds me is how difficult it is for people to step up to a leadership role. You know, it's like, it, there's so many, it's not like, oh, I'm a follower and now I'm a leader. One, just one little stepping stone. There's like, there's like a hundred steps, you know, there's like a hundred little insights and little identity shifts and little breakthroughs. Like there's a hundred steps at least. And I, I actually, this is, I just have so many open questions. It's like, like, do we need to outline those steps? You know, like some communities have like badges and levels and titles, like so clearly. I don't really want to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm like libertarian in the sense. I want people to just do what they want and love. But sometimes I get the feeling that maybe I need to, I need to provide some more structure. You ever think about that? Yeah, I do think about that. And, um, I think as some, oftentimes I think like as founders, we're very much the kind of people that love just staring into the abyss and, being creative and then bringing structure to things that are very ephemeral, right? Yeah. And um, opaque. And the there's a lot of people though out there that they really live off of structure, right? Mm -hmm. They need to see like a clear way. And I'm sure many of the people that are coming to building a second brain, that's part of the reason why they're coming, right? Is they have all these ideas, they're looking to write a book, but wanna figure out how to actually organize their thinking to prepare themselves to write that book or they're creating a lot of content or building a business and they want to start building a system yeah. for organizing everything in their brain. And so, yeah, I know, um, you know, shout out to David Spinks, uh, you know, an author, we both read his book, The Business of Belonging. He talks about the community commitment curve, right? This mm -hmm. idea that, um, you know, you may have someone in the case of building a second brain that uh, step one is, you know, they've read your book. Maybe step two of that commitment curve is they've joined your newsletter. Step three of that is they've joined one of your courses. Mm -hmm. Step four of that maybe is now they become um, an alumni uh, mentor. Step yeah. five of that is question mark. Step six yeah. of that is question mark. And kind of where do we, where does that commitment curve go? Is that someone maybe um, once they've now become an alumni mentor, do they now, if the next level of commitment maybe run a breakout session with people where, you know, that it's someone, maybe I'm an alumni mentor. I've written a book. I'm going to show you how I've used building a second brain to organize myself for a book. And someone else has done it and built a successful YouTube channel. They're going to run breakout sessions around the YouTube channel side of things. And then from there, maybe they, the next step is that they build a whole separate course yes. um, on just that specific niche. So you have the building second brain kind of umbrella, but under that, these alumni mentors eventually are becoming their own course creators under that with their more niched version um, of it. So that's an example in a long winded way, I guess, to say, 
I think it could benefit from structure. I think humans crave that oftentimes to understand exactly how they can participate in your community. I think that's so true. It's so true. And it's, it, it, and it's true. It's funny. It's like throughout my whole life, I've resisted so strongly any sort of system like that. Anytime there was a pathway or a ladder for me to climb or like anything like that, I'd just peace out. No, thanks. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, and maybe that's just my like baggage of why now I don't want to create what to me feels like a like a tool of subjugation. But you're right. For many people, like you need a ladder to climb to the next level like you just do. Yeah. And I think uh, on the other side, like, uh, you know, it's 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 tricky, though. And I completely empathize with where you're at. Right. Because you're even just trying to figure out how this community evolves and trying to, you know, crack that nut over the course of this year mm -hmm. and then to go and kind of have to step out there on a limb and then actually go and maybe give people structure when you're not even sure it can be tricky. I know um, with Founder OS, like it's a evolving community. And I find myself when I'm trying to figure out like, what should my priorities be in terms of evolving this community? It oftentimes just helps to just to be on the books that we're reading and the talking, you know, we're doing with other founders like ourselves. Also just going and talking to some of those really yeah. power community members. I have a conversation with one of our biggest, uh, you know, community members on in terms of our leaderboard that we have inside our school community talk, a conversation with them tomorrow just to understand kind of what would 11 out of 10 community look like for you is there any other ways you'd like to get involved with this community any other ways you'd you know you'd like to see it develop over the next six six months to a year and just kind of co-creating it with some of those power members so true i always forget that oh yeah talking to people <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Getting outside the building. How, what, what does it look like out there? It's <laughs> so important. I know that that's actually, gosh, I need to write this down. It's like, I've tried everything, but the most obvious thing. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's always so funny though, with all these things, I feel like that's oftentimes what it comes back to. I was talking to actually a founder just before this. Um, and you know, one other th thing I've kind of learned, um, Sam Ovens actually, uh, was someone that helped me learn this. It's like oftentimes with our community, we find ourselves in these roles, especially I think as course creators, where you are sort of sometimes the center of attention and you're teaching people in kind of that one to many approach. Oftentimes I find like a simple kind of hack to get around that as well as like actually prompting the community with questions, mm -hmm. right? So like you're in your community board, like getting people in there with building a second brain as an example, like, hey, can you uh, go and show how you're currently using building a second brain and one right. of the maybe the two biggest breakthroughs you've had and just encouraging that participation under a prompt that you give mm. the community each week you know i really like that yeah it's almost like giving them an excuse to oh well since you asked <laughs> exactly exactly um yeah, yeah because it, like any like any community right we're always going to have those people that are much more passive and maybe not going to take it on their own um, behalf to kind of like contribute. I'm curious on like, to kind of like a similar ish sort of subject that I know, uh, you've been going and exploring, uh, with your, um, endless curiosity is the area of like AI. I'm curious, you know, how are you kind of, uh, currently looking at that? Any intersections with, uh, your ventures on the course cre creator side, you know, how, how are these kind of things interacting in your brain right now? Yeah, I mean AI. Gosh, if you're not at least curious about AI, uh, I think I think you're in trouble these days. Um, I'm I'm just in pure exploration mode right now. Uh, just talking to people. I met here yesterday with one of the um, the curators of the the top AI newsletters, who was just kind of educating me. Uh, and it's really it's it's both out of necessity because I mean, what am I teaching? How to use software to manage information. AI is targeting that like a heat seeking missile. Like that's, that's going to be the first in the first wave of, of, you know, things to be destroyed or at least transformed. Um, so it's out of necessity, but also out of possibility. Like when I step back and look at what I do as just, as just like leverage creativity, let's say, I don't care about any particular piece of software. Like who cares? Who cares what, what note taking app you use? That's so trivial. What AI seems to be doing is letting you just skip all that, like go straight from inputs to outputs and skip all the in-between steps, which is all the steps people don't like doing and aren't good at anyway. So I almost think it's going to, it's not going to, it's going to accelerate how you build a second brain and ultimately express your ideas by just completely eliminating entire steps. Um, so 
I don't know. Some some ways that I tend that I tend to learn about new things is by making things. I think you have to tinker, mm-hmm. right? You have to talk to people. You got to talk to them in person because there's. I was just reeling yesterday, like talking to someone in person who's passionate about AI is so different than reading another tweet storm about how ninety nine percent of people are using AI wrong. <laughs> Um, and then we're thinking of, 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 so the, the ultimate way to really accelerate your learning is to sell something like put your, put your butt on the line, you know? So we're thinking of I'm running a, like an AI camp where we bring nice. people out for a week and just, you know, just basically hack on AI stuff, uh, or maybe like more like a summit or maybe like a cohort based course or something, um, just to test people's appetite for it, start to, you know, continue developing our own expertise and and just see what a business model. I think it, it's so early, like no one even knows what would you even teach. What what is even the best practice or the right way? And people have said that as an objection, but to me, that's what makes it most exciting. Oh, I get to I get to inv- like you were saying, there's, it's a complete space of open possibility. I get to invent the most possibly potentially the most fundamental frameworks and lenses through which people see this stuff. That to me is the, just the most exciting thing. Yeah, no, I'm very similar to you. And I think that the best way to learn anything is by doing. And, you know, with this, you know, advent of GPT-4, ChatGPT, the wave of interest around this area. Yeah, you see people reading and talking to people, but I think there's no better way to kind of pick up the skill and form your own sort of thesis and understanding of it than just by getting your hands dirty and getting into it. Over the weekend, I spent around 15 hours going and kind of looking at my whole notion content system, content calendars and figured, okay, how do I start taking, say, a long form thread uh, for Twitter and start to use notion AI as an example to transform that into a long form YouTube script into 10 different tweets into a newsletter outline and just trying to see the power of using it to basically help me not write these things, but at least just flush out like an initial V1. Um, in some cases also do research for things like even this podcast. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see and form your own opinion because I oftentimes, you know, and I'm sure you've seen this, like you'll read a, a Twitter thread and you, you your understanding after that is, oh my gosh, AI is replacing everything. Right. I oftentimes find that I actually get my hands dirty and start using it and going, oh, no, actually, there's, it's a ways away, uh, you know, going and forming things like personal experiences, real storytelling around things. I haven't found that there's a lot of limits around its copywriting potential still. Oh, yeah. Um, that at best, I think it's in many cases good for an initial V1 sort of research kind of scrub with these things and just getting your brain going and kind of helping me overcome things like writer's block. But it's certainly not replacing me. Um, as an actual creator, at least yet. Definitely, yeah. And it's going to take so long to play out. Like this is another thing I think about a lot is is how tech adoption comes in waves. And those waves, they feel fast, but they take a long time. Like like in a funny way, like really stepping back here, we, you know, people like us, we're like, oh, digital note-taking, that's been around forever. We're, we're almost like moving past that. We're like, no, I'm not going to sit there and take, you know, meticulous digital notes. I'll just use AI. But if you if you look at the world, Another reason I love travel and just talk to people not in this little bubble of ours, like they're just hearing about the wave that we left, you know, they're just hearing about like Evernote, digital notes that you you can sync them between your devices and you can do a search like my mind is blown. And I'm like, wow, like most of the world, I, I could really spend the next 10 or 20 years just onboarding that wave, that that group of people to the way that I already left. And that seems more obviously valuable than, you know, and more at least more predictable than trying to create this whole next wave. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think. Uh, as founders, I see this all the time, you know, these trends, they can look so enticing and sometimes be that kind of shiny object that you just want to kind of ditch everything and go deep in it and totally upend your model. But I feel like there's two kind of perils of that. Number one is oftentimes, you know, when that trend sort of dissipates, Mm -hmm. you got to ask yourself, like, do I actually enjoy this thing? Right. If I'm getting into AI, is this something that I actually want to be doing for five, 10 years, even as there's you know, hills and massive valleys, maybe in that sort of trend line. And then the other side too is, you know, versus kind of looking to just completely shift and upend things, you know, how do you kind of take like the top 20% of benefits you've seen from it and maybe just reinforce what you're already working on um, and bring that to what you're doing versus just suddenly just shifting your entire focus, at least so early on when, 
you're really just forming your own thesis and philosophy around that new thing, in this case, AI. I think that's so hard to do because as creators, we're sensitive to the environment. That's what makes us good. You know, we're, we, we sense all these subtle little shifts and trends and memes, but, but it's, it's, it's actually interesting. When I look back, it's like the major turning points in my career, I was counter cyclical. I was doing the exact opposite. Like every time, like 2013, I start blogging. It's hard to remember now with Substack and everything, but the unanimous opinion was blogging is dead in 2013, <laughs> right? Especially the way that I was doing it, which was like super long form, like massive essays, um, getting into very esoteric detailed topics. Everyone was like, this is crazy. No one's going to read this. And then like years later, now we have Substack. Um, when I launched Building a Second Brain as a cohort-based course in 2016, the unanimous opinion was, oh no, now all courses will be self-paced and you got to, it's like a race to the bottom, make them very, very cheap, you know, have no like manual involvement because you just need to keep costs low. And I came in at like this like super high price, the exact opposite. So it's like, it's like, well, who, who teaches this? And what are the models? Like everyone looks to the model to the, the uh, looks to the person who's killing it as a model. But they're only killing it because they're doing the thing. They were they started doing the thing when everyone said it was the worst idea ever back then, you know? Right. Yeah, no, I think, you know, we live in a day and age where it's like information overload at all times and sensory inputs from whether it's the media, friends, family, email, and, you know, a thousand other ways. And I think something that gets lost, especially as founders, is just the power of intuition mm -hmm. and the power of like going inward more, getting still, blocking out the noise for a minute. And sometimes you may even trust your intuition and you get it wrong. But even in that case, at least you're honing your intuition. Yes. Versus going and just getting all these sensory inputs and just kind of going with what this person's doing or that person and missing the opportunity to maybe, you know, actually listen to that voice inside and, and trust your gut. I'm curious on your side, you know, with all these things going on, right? We got AI, we're driving deeper into community. You're trying to figure out how to get even more outside of the business and continue to put on more and more autopilot and find that balance. How do you find time for kind of deep work and minimize distractions amidst everything you have going on? Um, and what does a, uh, you know, deep work look like for you? Yeah. I mean, it's a constant battle, it's a constant battle because I, I, my greatest curse and blessing is that I just love what I do so much. I, I just love it. I love sitting down and doing my email because every email is related to what I care about and what I'm passionate about, which, you know, people might be jealous of, but it's also like a curse, like in the evening, you know, hanging out with the family and my two kids, I'm like composing how I'm going to craft this email, this message in my head. And it's difficult to turn my mind away from because it's so enticing. It's so attractive. Honestly, it's, it's a constant battle. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things you've talked about that I agree hundred percent on. I, but I cannot agree on this passion for email. That is one <laughs> thing we do not have in common. I certainly do not have a passion for email. Um, and so in terms of like when you're going though, and you're diving deep into these, like, are you the kind of person that's going and blocking off like four hours to go deep and in the morning, push forward an, an area of something? Or, you know, what does that look like when you're kind of in that monk mode? Yeah, I definitely go through seasons, kind of like, like you said, different themes or, you know, periods. Um, one of the, the most interesting ones the past couple of years has been having kids. Uh, because previous to that, I had that kind of hustle mentality of like, my time is worth nothing. Every problem. Okay. Let me just throw egregious amounts of time at this. <laughs> and that was like fun, you know, like, Oh, I have to spend the all weekend working on this. Awesome. That's more fun than anything else I'd be doing. <laughs> um, which, which there were some benefits to that. Like, I think it's, it's good to have a season in life where you really learn how much you can get done in a small amount of time. If you just ignore everything else. Um, but then having kids now, suddenly the amount of time that I am working just in general, probably was cut in half. Like was seriously about 50%. I finished most days around like 1 PM, which uh, according to my previous self are like half days, you know, 8 AM to 1 PM is a half day. <laughs> uh, but it's forced me and this is such a cliche, but it's so true. It's just forced me to be so much more discerning. You know, now when someone wants to get on a call, 
that I'm just like, eh, I don't know if I want to talk to them or if I do a task that's sort of, oh, I don't know if this is really necessary. That just took up like a meaningful percentage of my work week, right? Um, and so I'm just being so unsparing and kind of just unapologetic about that. And, and then when, when it's like when the total number of hours shrinks, it's kind of like the water line is going down and you can, things start to emerge and be more clear and you just have to be very honest with yourself. Um, and I, looking at that, honestly, the times that I'm creating by far the most value is like you said, deep work. It is sitting down, going inside, deep into my like internal ideas and mind and creating either a new idea, a new framework, a new paradigm, a new story. Um, and so I try to block off all mornings. Uh, it's very rare for me to accept a morning meeting. Yours was an exception. Uh, <laughs> you made it through so, the filter. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, because yeah, it's like, it's like, um, that's my job. That's, that's my unique value that I give to the world is inception, the inception of new ideas. For sure. And I can imagine too, like, you know, we're both perfectionists, right? Um, and I think a lot of people listening <laughs> suffer from perfectionism and it's a constant battle, right? The battle of, I could work on this for another day or another week, or it'll be better in another month. But then that kind of balance of like, at some point I got to ship this thing. I'm curious too, yes. like now that you're a parent, you know, you're saying your time, as you say, you're doing half days. And so there's probably a degree too, that you just got to kind of let go of some of that perfectionism. I would imagine even more, which for guys like us, I'm sure can be very, very difficult. How do you kind of conquer perfectionism? So hard. Oh my God. Yeah. I just have to let things go that are good enough. I mean, it's again, such a cliche, but like, you know, I have the over here on my, on my table, the manuscript of my book in Portuguese. This is a great example right? So it's been translated by a professional translator, very, very skilled. I have no reason to think it's not good. I've read like the first chapter or two and I, I speak Portuguese because my family's Brazilian. I know it's good. I know it's definitely good enough. But like, as we speak, I'm at war with myself because my standard is to freaking proofread that whole thing word for word. <laughs> <laughs> And I just saying, even saying that I know, I know that is the worst possible use of my time, but I still want to do it. Why? What is it in me that feels, is it like the fear? If they're like, who cares if there's a typo, a mistranslated, like, honestly, who cares? But yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's also, you know, there's a balance of, yeah, exactly what you're saying. And I find too, oftentimes, especially early on when you're building a business, you really are that bar for quality. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're that person that's kind of like setting that standard for a while until you've, you know, brought on a great team of people that hopefully they're raising that bar. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to kind of make that transition from, OK, I'm the guy setting the bar and need to kind of, kind of like overlook things to ensure that, you know, there's kind of quality control, if you will, to then being on the other side to it where, you know, the practice is actually just continually surrendering and letting go. Um, it you know, really it's challenging. Is. It really is. And showing up like we have three sort of executives, like the, the senior people. And it's like, in some cases, they're, they're being too perfectionistic, right? So then I show up and I'm like, oh my gosh, now my job is to be like, just chill. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, did I just say just chill? <laughs> <laughs> it's very weird. Very weird. I know uh, an another thing that you're really big on is, is people, you know, developing a, a writing habit. And I think for both of us, you know, at least, you know, I, I, I believe it's like probably been one of the biggest game changers that we've had in terms of a skill that we've had that's really helped change the trajectory of our life or of our career. And most importantly, yeah. I think propel our sort of mission forth in the world is by, you know, writing down our insights, editing those insights, and then sharing them uh, with, you know, other people that can glean a lot of insights from it and, and learn. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how did you develop your writing habit and what's your advice to those that are trying to pick up writing? Yeah, gosh, we're, we're living in such a writing revolution. I feel like Substack, <clears throat> most of all, um, is just, I mean, I, 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 I'm shocked by, I mean, I've worked closely with David Perel on Rite of Passage and I'm friends with the Ship 30 guys. Like I never would have guessed there were so many people out there who wanted to write and be writers, like truly shocked. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought I was just a big weirdo, but, uh, oh my God, writing, I can't even, it's hard to even express, uh, how pivotal it's been at every single stage. 
Um, I started when I was so young, like 14 years old. We lived in Brazil, uh, me and my family. And uh, I would write these letters about our adventures living in Brazil on a super early, this is the late 90s, like compact laptop computer, like old school, right? And I would write these emails back home. That was the first time I, I think I wrote when I didn't have to, when some, someone wasn't forcing me to. Um, and since then, I've always either had a blog, like a travel blog when I was abroad, or a student blog when I was in college, or did some writing when I was in the Peace Corps in Ukraine. Uh, and then it only became professional like a decade and a, or a decade and a half into, into that experience. Um, but it just, it's how I make sense of reality. I, I literally don't know what even happened, much less what it means or what I should take away from it or what I, what I concluded or what I learned until I write. It's like, it's like raw data, you know, it's ones and zeros until I get that data and I translate it into human into human thought. Yeah, no, I think uh, the, just the, the act of writing oftentimes brings clarity to ideas that oftentimes in our brain are still kind of half baked. And it's been something that, um, yeah, just that continual practice of waking up, having a nice Americano, sitting down and just writing every morning. Um, while sometimes you have no clue what you actually want to put on that paper or on your computer, mm -hmm. it's amazing just how much like the practice of it helps filter out uh, the noise and kind of make sense of, of the world. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's pivotal for business too. To me, to me, writing is leadership. It's straight up leadership. You know, it's like there was probably a time in history where like leadership was like your ability to, you know, wield a sword and ride into battle at the head of your troops. But today leadership is, you could say, wielding an idea and writing onto the internet, you know, like that, like, or right, or, or, or waiting into your a meeting or a conflict in your organization. It's like everything is downstream of the quality of your thinking. And the quality of your thinking, I just don't know any other way to improve it other than writing. That's that's just, that's it. Yeah. Now, and speaking of writing, you brought up our good friend, Dickie Bush uh, from Ship 30 for 30. Um, I saw Dickie the other day, shared this concept of a frustration list. Mm. And basically a frustration list being just a list uh, that you have somewhere of just things that are frustrating you. And I've actually been practicing this recently, just a simple note of my phone, frustration list with a angry emoji on either side of it. And anytime I find myself, it could be the most insignificant thing, like, uh, you know, losing something all the way to, uh, you know, a meeting that didn't go well, or a person I'm interacting with that didn't go well, or has frustrated me, um, and kind of implementing this new practice of essentially once a month coming back to that frustration list now, and developing either a system for removing the frustration, maybe just eliminating that thing that is frustrating me, um, or, you know, delegating it if it's a task that I just don't enjoy doing any longer. I love um, that. That's so cool. Yeah. Cause it, no, it made me think, and again, big shout out to Dickie. Cause it's like, oftentimes our hat, like when we think about like happiness, right. It's this like ephemeral kind of like random thing that we're always seeking. Oftentimes it's like, how do we just focus on the things that are frustrating us or angering us? And just remove those things from our life so that whatever's left over are probably, you know, decent, good, peaceful, content type feelings. And yes. so, um, yeah, no, I'm excited to practice this more um, and, you know, find some systems to, again, remove these kind of frustrations. Um, you know, the good news is there's not a ton of them, but there's enough that, uh, you know, there's a, that we can uh, we can do some work here. I'm curious, you know, I love that. Things come up for you that frustrate you or right now as you're kind of continuing to kind of put things on autopilot, what's your process there from going from, okay, this is something that I don't want to be involved in or I shouldn't be involved in any longer to actually going and delegating that thing? Yeah, I can't, I, again, I, I can't say that it's at the systematic level yet. <laughs> it's more just like every day, there's so many different kinds of changes. Um, I mean, I work with a, with a business coach who is like very close to a therapist I'm actually meeting with her like in one hour. Um, and she, oh, she helps me with so much. You know, sometimes you have to have a confrontational uh, conversation with someone. That's, that's what's next. That's what's needed. Other times uh, you need to give them a new role or new title or change their salary up or down um, or make someone accountable for something or make them not accountable for that or switch the accountability. It's like, this is why I'm always amazed the kind of tweet tweet that annoys me the most, there's a lot, a lot of tweets would be on my frustration list. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> 
it, there's this format that's taken off, which is just like being a CEO is just about one thing. And then they say one thing. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> it's like the reductionism, you know? Um, yeah. And maybe it's just because I'm still learning, but I find it's, 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 it's about a million things. And uh, I'm so new to this. I'm, I'm, I've only had, you know, full-time staff for a couple of years and we have a tiny team that I work at, with every single one of them very directly. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I feel like such a beginner in the world of management, but the, the, the overall direction is to just empower everyone, but especially my three leaders. So it's, it's taken so long to get to the point to even have executives. It feels like a miracle, like that. I trust another human being miracle. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now I'm just like, well, in what ways do I still not trust them? In what ways could I trust them? In what ways could they be empowered to be more trustworthy are the kinds of, of questions that sometimes I'm just, I, I'll just bring it to them. You know, like they, they, they often make fun of me that I'm so transparent. They're like, Tiago, you could, you could hold things a little closer <laughs> to your vest. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing more magical in your business, though, when you just find great people to help kind of take things to the next level. Um, on the the systems for delegation side, one thing I've learned over the last uh, year or so that I found really useful is this kind of simple system of, say, I'm trying to go and put more of my own role on autopilot, um, mm -hmm. basically doing a calendar audit of, say, my neck, my last 60 days, mm -hmm. literally going through Google Calendar. And maybe if you're using a sauna for tasks or whatever, using for task management, going and looking at like write down in a Google sheet as an example or some sort of table, just every task you've worked on. Mm. And then sort of from there, uh, once you have like every task written out, you could even get a virtual assistant or an assistant to do this for you. Mm. Or chat Basically TV. going or chat TPT. <laughs> <laughs> not, not sure about that one, but I'm sure maybe there's somehow. Um, and then, you know, the second aspect is kind of going through those and basically marking like, um, like, should you delegate this? And, you know, do you like, basically, do you want to delegate this? Right. And if it's stuff that like, you don't want to be working on that, you should be delegating, right. Then kind of just like marking all those micro tasks down. Mm -hmm. And then in the next column, I basically put like, who I should delegate it to, mm -hmm. right. Is it someone on the social team that needs that, that task now? Is it a writer? Is it an operations person? Mm -hmm. And then the last two, I think are where the kind of rubber hits the road. I basically prepare a Google Docs system mm -hmm. around how to do that task mm -hmm. or have someone help me with it. Mm -hmm. And then the last part is then just record a loom video of me doing it. That's and, so and then, good. And then from there, you've got a list of every single thing you've done over the last 60 days. Let's just say 70% of that, you're like, I don't want to do this stuff anymore. So you know you're going to delegate it. You've indicated who you're going to delegate that stuff to. You have a doc on it and you have a loom video of you actually doing it to the fullest of your ability. That way they can always refer back to the loom or the doc to go and do it themselves moving forward to whoever you delegate it to. That's and I found so this to be good. a complete game changer just to get a ton, a ton of stuff off my plate and help empower people. Cause it's nice. You don't need to have constant training meetings with people to go over the things you're delegating. They just go, they go through the doc, they mark that they were trained on that task once they've watched the loom and they feel comfortable with it. And they're off to the races. And if they ever need to refer back to it, they just go back to this master doc. There's two things I love about that. One is that it's retrospective because I'll, I'll often do that for the coming month, but it doesn't work because you're like everything theoretically sounds necessary and important and interesting. Right. But once you've had the call, you can be like, that sucked. <laughs> um, and then 60 days is cool too. Cause often, even if I look back at the last month, I'm like, oh, that was a one-off. That was unique. Right. This was a unique month. If you look at two months, you can't tell yourself that. Right. Yeah, no, there's a certain patterns that emerge. And yeah, no, it's interesting, right? Like we both, I think, agree that 50% of entrepreneurship is like you're planning it out. You have a, a vision for where you're going. And then 50% is just an emergent strategy that just kind of comes up. And so if you can start to pay attention to both the things that maybe you plan to do and all the stuff that just for some reason or another comes up and start to think about, should I actually be doing this? And do I actually want to be doing this? And being intentional about doing that kind of scrub, maybe once a quarter, every half year, I think you, you know, both free up your time to do things you love and are able to delegate the rest. And also you're empowering others around you to start maybe taking stuff off your plate that they probably already believe they should be doing and that you don't need to do any longer. Totally. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting because you, you have to keep that 50% open for those emergent things. Mm -hmm. Like this, this is something I continuously learn too, is like, 
you think, oh, I want to, I want to create as much value. Something like pack in all these like commitments and things. And, and it feels unproductive. It feels almost irresponsible to just have completely unstructured entire afternoons or days with nothing. But that emergent, totally unexpected, uh, unpredictable thing will predictably happen. And you, it's like there's this book Slack that talks about this, how to be maximally efficient, speaking of systems, any system needs Slack, any system. The second you have zero Slack, the system locks up and it completely freezes and crashes. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, well, this has been a ton of fun, Tiago. I really appreciate you taking the time, especially in your morning, to be on this. <laughs> I don't know how I, I, I slipped through these filters. we got to talk to whoever allowed that. Um, if, for those that are looking to uh, check out Tiago's work, uh, be sure to check out buildingasecondbrain.com. Check out his book. I highly recommend it. Um, thanks again, Tiago. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It was, a, it was a real pleasure. Got some great ideas. Awesome. Thank you so much.